Oh, hello, and welcome to my very serious podcast, Hannah Wonders. Nah, I'm just kidding. What's up, my dudes? Uh, It's awesome to have this outlet. I'm super excited that I finally jumped the gun and um, decided to start my own dramaturgy-based podcast. So welcome to Hannah Wonders about the wonderful world of theater. Special shout out um, to my friends Carrie and Carolyn um, who have helped me to design the the pod and um, Carolyn did the awesome design work for me. Um, and a special thanks as well to Talking Poop Podcast, who has been super supportive on this road to um, starting up my own. So I want to make sure I thank those um, humans. While I had been deciding what I wanted um, the first episode to really be, um, <laughs> I got some pushing along the way um, from Jason at Talking Poop um, to do something that crossed over into his genre. Um His podcast is about the movies, music, and media that define us. So um, along those lines, I decided to pick up with his recommendation of Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark. Um, So it's a nice crossover between the comic world um, and our Broadway world. And this has been a really fascinating research project. Uh, There's just so much to unload with this show. So I'm super excited to dive into the details about it with you. Um, And as you'll notice as I go along with this pod, this is very listener based. I want to know what you don't know about. I want to hear about shows I've never heard of and dive into them. So as we're going through this, if you think of anything um, that you just really want to know the details on, the history of um, or the creation behind a production, please go ahead and just hit comment and I would be happy to do that. All right, let's get started. One of the most intriguing things about doing this show um, as a research initiative is just how little I know about it or did um, until I started looking into it. I had heard what most people had, which is all the bad press about actors getting hurt, uh, how much money they lost on the production, you know, all the fun stuff. So today I want to take you on a little ride through um, the creation of this project and what, at the end of the day, ended up being its biggest downfall. So uh, I hope you enjoy. So there's a couple things you need to know. This show's development is a story within itself. And honestly, it's the most interesting thing about this piece of theater. It speaks to the need of a formal new work production process, which I believe could have alleviated many of the issues that the production ran into. When I refer to a traditional new work process, what I'm speaking to is the years of workshopping a script, um, the road to Broadway, which includes out of town performances, um, and those allow the creators um, and the creative team to hear audience feedback and shift and change things before it hits Broadway. So as we dive into this, it's important to know that the show did not have a traditional lead to Broadway before it opened. The other thing is we're going to be talking about two different scripts. The original book was written by Julie Taymor and Glenn Berger. And when a lot of reviewers were Um, panning this show, it was because they had seen the original script, which is that one by Julie Taymor. I also want to say about Julie that I'm a huge supporter of her work. And even though this didn't work out, I'm a huge fan of her creative side. And I'm a huge supporter of female directors in general. We need more of them. So huge shout out to her. The rewrites that we'll be hearing about um, were from Roberto Aguirre Sacasa, and he uh, actually had dabbled in work with comic books and graphic novels, which really, uh, I think, helped define the story that they were trying to create, but we'll get to that in a moment. So according to the New York Post, this all started when Bono began composing Spider-Man after he heard Andrew Lloyd Webber say, I'd like to thank rock and roll musicians for leaving me alone for 25 years. I've had the theater all to myself. Oh, my snarky, snarky Andrew Lloyd Webber. I love him so much. Um, In August of 2002, Marvel announced uh, that Tony Adams would produce a stage musical based on the origin story of Spider-Man with the story rooted in the original comic canon. 
Adams approached Bono and The Edge to be involved as the music creators, and then they pulled in Julie Taymor um, into the project. Of course, we know who Bono and The Edge are, and if you're a fan of U2, you are going to enjoy their music. Um, the songs in this show will definitely resonate with you. It is very much that sound. Uh, Julie Taymor is the creative genius behind the direction of Lion King, the musical. Um, and she's also known for her incorporation of surreal elements, especially mask work. Um, it was really cool to do some research on her. Uh, a lot of her early work was very bizarre, avant-garde um, pieces, really dark and you'll see that even in Lion King, um, it has a darker edge to it. And that's kind of her staple. So in the early production of the show, the readings of this musical began in 2007. So you think about they began talking about this piece, piece in 2002. And that was right after the success of the original series with uh, Tobey Maguire kicking off. Um, but the show had a lot of snags. And we're going to jump into some of those bigger ones in a moment. But I think in order for you to truly appreciate what this show went through as far as changes, it helps to know the plot of both versions of the story. So let's do a little storytelling. So the first version or first iteration of this show was really true to Tamor's vision. She felt that the comics and comics in general already operate on a mythic motif. And specifically with this uh, script, she was looking at Greek motifs. The show begins with a fantastic and over-the-top reference to the comic book stylings it was based on, with a battle of strength between Green Goblin and Spider-Man. The story is told in part by a Greek chorus of characters. There were four of them. These characters are meant to reflect the other Greek themes that are infused into the show, such as one of our main characters, Arachne. For those of you who aren't familiar with the story of Arachne, she um, was essentially a uh, princess who bragged about being able to weave the most beautiful tapestries. Um, she ended up offending the gods, uh, and they, I believe it was specifically Athena, uh, who destroyed her tapestry that she had woven. And then um, in like a fit of despair, she killed herself. Athena then comes down and takes pity on her and turns her into a spider so that she can continue to weave, but she'll forever live in darkness and solitude for eternity. So now that you know the backstory of that character, you'll see how the Greek influences really affected Tamar's vision. The Greek chorus explains at the beginning that Peter Parker isn't the first of his kind to go from man to spider and tells the story of Arachne. After we meet her, the story moves on to the typical Peter Parker story. He was bullied in school. Parker is in love with Mary Jane, his neighbor. He gets bitten by a spider in a class field trip. His uncle Ben is killed and Parker decides it's necessary to alleviate his guilt by using his powers to help others. Throughout these scenes, the Greek chorus comes in and out discussing whether Parker was bitten because of fate, uh, that he was chosen by the spider, or maybe it was just dumb luck. For those comic fans, I want to point out that a piece of canon here in this iteration of the story is that uh, it's reflected that Parker's selfishness is what gets his uncle killed. So he goes to the wrestling or the, you know, the, the boxing match, wrestling match. And um, when he's leaving, he sees somebody stealing his nemesis's car. And instead of stopping him, he lets it go. And that car is what ends up killing his uncle Ben. So you'll see that he blames his own selfishness for that. And that does change in the second revision. One of the big moments of the show that is virtually kept the same in both versions is how Parker decided what his costume should look like. And there's this moment in both um, the first and second version where Arachne gives him a costume made with the colors that she described as, for every heart that bleeds will color your world red and the sorrow in the night will be the blue you cannot shed. Super poetic. I love that. While we see Parker doing the usual getting a job at the newspaper by taking selfies deal, we're also getting back a background story from uh, Dr. Osborne. 
So it was in his lab that Parker was bitten, and Osborne is now being pushed by the military, who's funding his experiments, to hurry them along. His work was about splicing genes from various species into human DNA to create superhumans. In his attempt to speed up this process, he decides to use it on himself first. In the process, he kills his wife, and it totally makes him crazy. In this version of the show, Green Goblin was killed off in an epic battle at the end of Act 1. So where you might think that he's going to be the antagonist, then he kind of, he gets killed off, and instead of thinking, oh, well, he might be coming back, no. Instead, we get a different villain. Act 2 begins with another intense battle where Spider-Man takes out Carnage, Swarm, Craven the Hunter, Electro, and the Lizard. This is when shit gets weird, as if it wasn't already. As the second act unfolds and the romance blooms between MJ and Parker, there's this really weird scene where Arachne comes to Parker in his dreams and begins messing with his version of reality, blurring the lines between real and fake with the intention of making him love her. Yes, that was a question mark. I don't understand how that makes sense, but I suppose it does. Essentially, Arachne keeps messing with Parker and his relationship um, with MJ, and so it seems to all be with the intention to break them up so that Arachne can be with him. Super strange. She's a spider. Um, but essentially, like, Parker feels that his relationship to MJ is suffering, and he wants to hang up the suit. He feels that he's not doing a good enough job. He, of course, picks it back up, as our hero does, in an effort to save um, MJ from Arachne, who at this point has captured her and is holding her ho hostage in a giant web. A literal giant web. Side note, in the original production, there was actually supposed to be a huge web above the audience for this battle to happen. They couldn't quite get the web to work out the way they wanted, but I still think it's a cool concept. Somehow during the very last scene of the original iteration, Arachne just changes her mind about stealing Parker from MJ and everything magically gets better. Obviously some plot issues here. Then there's the second version. There are rumors about how this all happened, but essentially Tamor left the project after a few months of previews. Yes, I said months. I'll elaborate in a minute. The biggest changes to pay attention to are the change in the antagonist and the removal of the Greek chorus. Thank God, because that was just a terrible decision. The new version opened to a scene of Parker giving a book report about Arachne. Discussing the mythic tragedy of her life, throughout the script, it's obvious that they've changed the role of Arachne completely from formal villain to more of this dream visitor. Um, it's, it's kind of unclear, but we know that it's more in his head uh, than it is um, an actual character in the story, which is what she was in the previous version. So then we jump to the usual Peter Parker stuff, bullying, blah, blah, blah. Peter goes to the science lab and is taking pictures for the school newspaper when the spider bites him. In this version, Parker has nothing to do with his uncle's death other than not being there to defend him. So this is a shift of focus from his selfishness in the first version to instead a lack of self-worth. He just feels he's not worthy um, and he just has like super emo days, which is pretty classic Peter Parker. I mean, he was a high school teenager with a lot of issues. Thankfully, the book writers added the most important line of any true Spider-Man iteration, with great power comes great responsibility. Of course, Uncle Ben doesn't say it to him, and instead he manages it to come up with this awesome thing by himself, but whatever. In this version, Peter makes his own costume and, again, gets paid for his mad selfie skills. And at the end of the rewritten Act 1, we see the transformation of Dr. Osborne into Green Goblin. So it's kicking off an entirely different plot from the original. Act 2 begins with a song by Green Goblin, and it is ridiculous, <laughs> about how he's going to make the rest of the world a freak like him. He experiments on his fellow employees, which is when we meet Carnage, Electro, Craven the Hunter, Lizard Swarm... So then we hit, oh, I'm going to mess up the world because I hate everyone from Green Goblin, who's just pissed because he accidentally murdered his wife. And he somehow wants to blame that on everyone else. Q epic fight, kidnapped girlfriend, Spidey saves the day, blah, blah, you get the idea. 
So you can obviously see already this huge shift in the plot from they minimized the Arachne role quite a bit, which I don't disagree with, but it definitely took away um, some of the originality, I guess, of the plot line. Um, I do think that it was a cool idea to start with, but it was obvious that it just didn't sit right with this type of show. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that again in a minute. We're going to jump back in time a bit so that you understand the changes that are about to come up. Um, so originally the cast included two very unlikely actors. I had no idea about this, but it was Alan Cummings as the Green Goblin and Evan Rachel Wood as MJ. After the first show um, delay when they went on hiatus, both of them left the project, which I'm not surprised, but um, you know, at least we got Evan Rachel Wood and a variety of other things. I think she probably was hitting across the universe about that time. And uh, so I'm not too sad about that. By early 2009, the production was already $25 million in debt and work on the project was suspended. During this time, Disney was looking to purchase Marvel, um, but made it clear that they had no interest in assisting financially or otherwise with the project. So by May of 2010, when they finally had enough money to continue, and it was slated to open uh, February 18th of 2010 at the Foxwood Theater. But again, the project was paused in order to fundraise. So by November of 2010, so like eight months later, the production was estimated to cost $65 million. So within that year, it went up by like 40000 It's ridiculous. Um, the, the craziest thing to me about this whole thing is not only was the investment really high for the technical aspects of this show, but just the running costs as in just to mount the show every week and have it going on with actors and the band and all the equipment was $1 million a week just to put it on. Then they start delaying the opening again and again. The reason given for these um, push-offs of the date were for quote-unquote creative adjustments. Um, and this was right before the release of Tamor from the creative team. Um, so in February of 2011, they brought in playwright and comic book writer Roberto Aguirre Sacasa. Uh, so he was invited to come in and essentially just rewrite the script. By April of that year, uh, the capitalization was reported to have grown to $70 million. And by opening, $75 million. For comparison, the typical Broadway musical at this point stands between five to 15 million. The other important thing to note about this production is that due to the high demand on the technical aspect of the show, it didn't go through a traditional out of town preview process. So as I was saying before, most shows will do a variety of out of town um, spots where, you know, the script might still be really rough, but they're going to run it as if it's the full blown production and then get feedback from the audience. That way they have time before it hits Broadway and things are really expensive to handle it. Because of how insanely customized all of the technical aspects were from the aerial stunts to the lighting projection CGI, they had to build and work in the same space that they were going to premiere the show. So they were already working at Foxwoods Theater just once they were off of table reads. All the rehearsal process had to happen in the actual performance space, which is a very specific thing to this production. After nine, and a, nine months of previews and extensions on the opening date, critics and press became impatient and attended the previews of the first script iteration. This is unheard of. Um, they usually only go to opening night. And there's a reason for that. Previews are an opportunity for the director to still technically stop the show. So if something's not working or they need to go back or reset something, they can. So for all of these critics and press to come to a preview, especially in a show that was already struggling and pushing off their opening dates, they were in for a world of hurt. And that's exactly what happened. So after the slander of the show in the press, that's when the creative team was on fire to make big changes. So this was in like winter 
of that year. And then by spring, Tamor was gone and they had a new book writer. The reception to the second version is my favorite thing because everyone agreed that the first version was a pile of dog shit, but it was original and it had a heartbeat and it had character development and it was different and refreshing and dark, um, which, which people liked, even though it didn't always make a lot of sense. After these changes, the biggest criticism of the show is that it was bland at best. And I can't really think of a worse thing to say about a theater production. Both iterations of the show included aerial arts, over-the-audience fights, crazy comic book-like set design, and insanely over-the-top costumes. I did find it interesting that one reporter commented that out of the two-and-a-half-hour show, only about ten minutes involved aerial work. Um, And the reason that's interesting is because it was the main point of the marketing, Uh, Not to say they didn't try to do more, but once they got into the space, like I said, with the web, it just wasn't working. Uh, They weren't able to make the equipment um, and mechanics function properly to do it in a safe way. Interestingly enough, even with all of the craziness of this production, the show was receiving between $100,000 and $300,000 in net income each week. So for reference, if the show costs a million dollars just to put up every week, that means they were bringing in between $1,100,000 and $1,300,000 each week in ticket sales for them to profit that much. Unfortunately, that would mean for the investors that the show would have had to continue bringing in that much for at least five years to make up the $75 million cost. There was a really brief discussion between the producers um, about maybe like every year adding a new scene or new songs um, to get the people who have already attended to return. Uh, And they were going to market it as a like new comic book issue. So like the next chapter in the story. I thought that was kind of cool. But I know why you're all here. I know you just want to hear about the injuries. So here you go. As of August 2013, there had been six injuries associated with the production. After two stunt doubles were injured during flying sequences and rehearsals, the New York State Department of Labor checked out those scenes in the show and cited them for two workplace safety violations. Then everyone's favorite OSHA, or Occupational Safety and Health Administration, fined the show $12,600 for three very serious safety violations. Actors' Equity also investigated and threw a fit. The most well-known accident from this show was with uh, the stuntman Tierney, who fell more than 20 feet, I'm not laughing because it's funny because it's terrifying, (laughs) but 20 feet off of a piece of scenery when his when his harness was not connected to the safety cord. Can you say, hell no. He free fell through the stage into the orchestra pit. And this was all during a preview of the show with a freaking audience. Of course, they closed down the show almost immediately after the incident, uh, for the night, I mean. And it was a huge ordeal. I mean, I think I heard rumors that the guy died. Thankfully, he was fine. He even ended up returning to the production later, but he was seriously injured and went through months of physical therapy. Natalie Mendoza was another victim of the show. She was the original Arachne um, in the previews um, up to opening, and she suffered a severe concussion during the first preview uh, when the uh, it was a... Uh, piece of equipment backstage she let it like somehow hit her she she did the most aerial work in the show um and she ended up with a severe concussion she was out for several weeks uh, she did end up coming back to reprise her role once she was healed up but she didn't stay long uh, mendoza's replacement then her name is tv carpio was injured during a performance the following march uh, she hurt her neck and was out for two weeks Then in August of 2013, Daniel Curry was hurt by being pinned under a piece of equipment and suffered leg trauma. The last two injuries um, were actually, they actually were caused by the same um, movement that that was happening on stage. So 
the idea is even though Reeve Carney starred as Spider-Man, in order to do these stunts, they obviously had stunt people. And because he had to move so quickly, um, by he I mean Spider-Man, they had multiples of them for every show. Uh, so while he was singing backstage, you had one Spidey swinging, you know, across the audience and then he would disappear and another one would go across the stage. So a little theater magic. So two of the stunt doubles within a month of each other doing the same movement it ended up hurting themselves. One of them broke both of his wrists and an, and the other one uh, broke his feet during during that same move. It was a mess. Super fascinating. Again, the rumor mill was pretty crazy. I, from what I heard, like, I honestly thought, like, everybody had died and they shut the production down. Because, <laughs> again, like I said, until I did this research, I didn't know much about it. So I guess at the end of the day, where do I stand? Let's see. Um, well, when it comes to the plot, while I do think the original plot line was more interesting, it was problematic, to say the least. To someone who is a half-assed comic book reader these days, um, I felt like, I don't know, the original version, the synopses and scene layout just came across as super convoluted and confusing. Uh, it was obvious that she was really interested in infusing the Spider-Man storyline with Greek mythology, but it just didn't work properly. It, it came out way too, I don't know, it was just too much. One of the best lines I read on this subject was from scholar and author Daniel Mendel Mendelshohn. One of the best lines that I read about the topic of the influence of Greek mythology and these motifs into the show, um, I found during my research, and it was from a guy who writes for the New York Journal um, of Books, and his name is Daniel Mendelshohn. He said, there is a crucial difference between the ancient and modern models of human to animal metamorphosis. For today's audiences, such transformations are liberating and literally empowering. Whereas for the ancients, there were much more often than not humiliations or punishment. At the heart of the show's disaster is the incompatibility of those two visions, the ancient and the modern, the redemptive and the punitive. Visions that Tamor tried heroically but futilely to reconcile. I know that's harsh, but it really makes a lot of sense. It explains why the plot felt so convoluted and kind of forced, like two puzzle pieces that just don't fit together. As far as the set and costumes and all of that is concerned, um, because I didn't have the opportunity to see the show live during a short run, I'm basing this off of photos, um, synopses, reviews, uh, and I do have to say, like, the photos of the set and costumes are spectacular. The Green Goblin in him, in itself um, is pretty mind-blowing, and it makes sense when you look at uh, Tamor's history with the Lion King, uh, how she played with puppetry. Uh, that's really, like, the, the Green Goblin kind of comes across that way. He is plated in this huge costume. It's very industrial-looking. Um, the spray paint job on it is amazing. I mean, it really is a beautiful piece. The set design was by George Sipin, and I thought he did a killer job of creating a forced perspective, which is really empowering and exciting for a Spider-Man musical. Um, there were There's moments in the show where Spider-Man's like on the top of the Chrysler building, and the way that the scene is set, you feel like you're looking down from the top of the Chrysler building as Spider-Man. So it's all this very forced perspective um, and pushing the audience into aerial views. So you really feel like you're with Spider-Man in these moments. Um, they also introduce CGI elements. So when you're looking at this, not only is it a forced perspective, it also has like you can see little cars going by at the bottom, um, which was fascinating. One of the best descriptions about the set I found was from reviewer David Rooney, who said, the show still lacks a unifying look and tone. It's mish mishmash, <laughs> that's fun to say, it's mishmash of 40 styles with contemporary references cause the looks to fall flat. Even with the elastic logic of a comic book world, it's disconcerting to have the newspaper editor of the Daily Bugle rant about the internet, bloggers, and Facebook 
while his secretarial pool hammers away at typewriters. So I totally agree with that, but that's more of a design aspect than it was like how they pulled it off. I do think that the artistry that was displayed was spectacular. All right, here's my biggest complaint, the music. Um, I think it was best summed up when uh, there was a reviewer that called Tamor a scapegoat for the downfall of being the downfall of this production. Um, because at the core, the biggest issue is the music. I mean, I can't tell you how many jukebox musicals have existed on Broadway and made millions of dollars on a half-assed book just because the music got the crowd going. And U2 already has the fame to write on for the soundtrack. So it should be way more obvious to people that that was the true Achilles heel of the show. This was all made worse by the super pretentious description that Bono gave of the music prior to its release. He said, It's wrestling with the same stuff as Roy Lichtenstein and the Ramones. We've moved out of the rock and roll idiom in places into some very new territory for us, including big show tunes and dance songs. <gasps> You mean you had to write a musical number for a musical you were writing? I mean, like, come on, whatever. I forced myself to listen to this boring garbage on repeat for an hour and a half, just for you listeners, hoping I would come to some sort of positive angle on it. But even if you're a huge U2 fan and actually own their records, you have to admit it's bland. It's like listening to the like middle tracks on a U2 CD, you know, like the ones that no one really pays attention to because they're kind of filler between their hits. So take those, hit repeat, add some super literal lyrics, and you've got the soundtrack to Spider-Man. The only nice thing I can say is the music highlights are the ballads. Reeve Carney, who played uh, Spider-Man, Jennifer Damiano, it's always hard to say, Damiano, um, who starred in Next to Normal. Um, and TV Carpio, who played uh, Arachne, have by far the best songs in the show. So after all of that, <laughs> like I said, the musical itself, I wouldn't pay to see it. It doesn't sound like something to me that was worth switching genres for. I think some things can be really well translated between genres, um, movies to theater to TV, books. But when it comes to this, it was a great concept. I applaud the creativity and the idea and the hard work that went into it. I mean, there was some really creative genius behind what they made. But ultimately, the payoff was non-existent. I mean, it was... At the end, just this fluff piece, Spider-Man musical that was had half-assed aerial arts and honestly probably made the audience terrified as if they were at a Cirque du Soleil show that somebody was going to fall out of the rafters. And they wouldn't be wrong had they been one of the preview audiences that probably would have happened. So, I mean, don't let me deter you. If you love U2 music, go check it out. I mean, um, some of the harder-hitting numbers are definitely up the U2 uh, catalog, but... For me, as somebody who's a lukewarm fan, it just didn't hit me. Uh, I, I would recommend listening to um, Jennifer uh, Damiano's song. Uh, she has a beautiful ballad in that one. Um, and then the end song on the released soundtrack also has a really beautiful ballad that um, Arachne sings. Other than that, I just don't find it to be an interesting piece. So... Here comes the fun part. I want to hear from you guys. Do you totally disagree with me? Am I full of it? Now that you've heard the research and know everything behind the show, go ahead and listen to the soundtrack. Let me know if I'm wrong. And especially let me know if this sparked any curiosity about a different production that you might like or just love to hate. I am here to do the research for you. You know, instead of spending hours doing it, why not just hang out with me for 30 minutes and find out all the interesting bits? Thank you so much for joining me on this weird beginning to um, hopefully a very successful and wild ride with my very own podcast, Hannah Wonders. Please share with your friends and family if you are so inclined, and I hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful day.